coming in with his name? See, I'm from Lionel Community Church. I can't name a few names.
food and the conference and all that sort of thing. Um, let's see, but I don't want to forget anything. If anybody has any questions about housing or anything, I'm going to be around and other people that can answer those kinds of questions. I want to say a special thank you to all the people that are coming here to do the workshop, the co-facilitators to the workshop, and the speakers. Uh, everyone I know has put in a lot of time and effort, and we just really appreciate that, and even a lot of money out of your own pocket. We appreciate that a lot. We also appreciate Lawndale, uh, Lawndale Community Church hosting this and making their facilities available, making all the housing arrangements. That's a big job, and we really, really appreciate that. Uh, I'm just kind of, I'm sure everybody's read your welcome letter in the, in the program, but I just kind of am thinking about that last paragraph where it says, Now glory be to God, who by his mighty power at work within us is able to do far more than we would ever dare to ask or even dream of, infinitely beyond our highest prayers, desires, thoughts, or hopes. That's Ephesians 3.20. And that is, uh, that's just, I think, a special verse for us for this weekend. The, uh, the last thing I want to do is to just uh, give a very, very special thanks to and introduce Reverend Wayne Gordon, who is the pastor and founder director for this ministry. And uh, I wonder when you can come out. Well, I'm here to welcome you. We're so excited that you're here with us in these next few days. We are so excited to know that God is among us and God is going to do a great work. And we've been praying for weeks and actually months for this day to come. We've been anticipating your arrival and hopefully it hasn't been too rough as you've gotten here. We uh, have heard all kinds of stories. Some of you have never ridden the L before and had to ride the L from the airport. And that's a part of urban ministry and a part of the city life. And we want you to experience that. John Perkins has ridden that L to my house and here in Lawndale many times. And so if John can do it, you can do it. Amen? Amen. Amen. Well, you know, really what we're here about tonight and for the next three or four days, we have not had a goal to have five or six or a thousand people, five or six hundred or a thousand people here. Our goal was to get together people like you who are doing things in urban ministry and ministry to the poor and Christian community development around our country and come together and let us talk and let us get to know each other. Let's find out what each other is doing. We hear all the time about it, but let's come together. And so now that's what's happening. And that is exciting, and we're looking forward to a great time as we've been. You know, about 15 years ago when I moved to Lawndale, some, I felt like a lone ranger many, many times. I didn't read John's book until I'd been in Lawndale for three or four years. And I know when I first moved to this community, everybody told me, you can't do it. Nobody would do anything like you do. White people can't live in black communities and all of those kinds of things. We are here, not me, but all of us here are a testimony to God's grace. We're not, we are one in Christ Jesus, not male or female, not Jew or Gentile, black or white, not slave or free, rich or poor, but we are one through Christ Jesus, and we are a testimony to God. Let's give God an amen, shall we? Real quick. All right, what do you got here? Ohio. Ohio. Yeah. Ohio. Ohio. Oh, 
respond for Jesus Christ. We want to see their souls saved. We want to see disciples being uh, made for Jesus in our inner city. And that's what this poem talks about. It's called Let Justice Cry. Let justice cry within my heart for the suffering, the weak, and the poor. But let it cry deeper for those in sin who have no Savior or Lord. May my heart throb with the pain that you feel, when no intercession is made, to call a dying world back to you so those who are lost can be saved. The filth, the decay of those who have need brings sorrow and tears to their eyes. But oh, what sorrow you must feel when sin has so blinded our eyes. I walk down the street to see weary souls struggle to make it another day. Life is so hard they want to give up. Does God want people to live this way? No, cries my heart. What can I do to help a weary soul today? I'll listen. I'll cry. I'll share what I can. Most of all, Lord, I must pray. I think that's the heartbeat of God. That whatever we do, we have to first understand that He wants people to come to know Him because He's the solution. I think that I can speak from a very personal standpoint because I grew up in poverty myself in Virginia near Appalachia. So if you've seen some of the little white kids from Appalachia, you probably have seen me in one way or another. Life was very difficult, and I can remember the struggles that I had growing up in poverty, feeling like a nobody. Kathy Nick says it very, very clearly and beautifully when she says, I want somebody to know my name. As I was growing up, that's what my desire was, that somehow I would feel that my life had significance and that someone would know my name. I can remember the frustrations of growing up in poverty because instead of being affirmed by a world that sees power and prestige and wealth as a standard, instead I was looked down upon and denied those very, very basic things that help us to feel that self-worth. When I started school, my dad was a, a sharecropper, farmer, illiterate, and my mother could bear the being right. And so we didn't learn a whole lot between the ages of birth and six years old. And when I started school, it was very, very difficult because I had a very mean first grade teacher. And that teacher, I can remember we would walk into the classroom and would sit down and she'd say, now hold your hand out. And we'd have to hold our hand out and she would check to see if they were dirty. And if they were dirty, she would take a ruler and she'd make us turn her hand over and she'd slap us with a ruler. And so I began to think that somehow God was punishing me for being poor and not having running water and having to walk so far to get it. And, and more and more my self-esteem began to deteriorate, my self-worth. It wasn't until many, many years later that I would find that self-worth in Jesus. And he's the one that wants to give us all silver. And that's why we as the church, as we go into the inner city, we have to see people the way Jesus sees them. Beyond the poverty, beyond the snotty noses, beyond the, the dirt. And instead of slapping them on the hand, we've got to embrace them and say, Jesus cares about you. And he's going to show you that. The fact that I'm going to love you. If you've ever heard the song in the 1960s called Down in the Boondocks, you've heard my story. Because it goes like this, if you haven't heard it. It says, down in the boondocks, down in the boondocks, people put me down because that's the side of town I was born in. You know, I was, I was at the donut shop this morning, and I happened to mention Lawndale, and all the eyes went up. What are you doing in Lawndale? And I began to have the flood, once again, of those memories somehow being born on the wrong side of town, not really having the resources that made me somebody. And so I began to tell them all the wonderful things that God was doing in Lawndale and how God was in Lawndale. And it was exciting. 
through the years, I was able to accomplish that dream. I married a man, even as the song says, that lived on the other side of the track. His father was a judge and a lawyer. Wealth was in the family. And it wasn't long until we had wealth. Four bedroom house, three, uh, two car garage, circular drive, three bedroom, and uh, three baths, big fancy luxury van, and I guess the world said I was somebody. But the Lord said, now go back to the Unfortunately, just like the song said, I didn't want to look back. But I couldn't get away from the conviction and from the burden. Every time I'd open up the Word of God, the Lord would once again remind me of His heart wrong to minister to the needs of the poor. One of the scriptures, Wayne, was the scripture that you read. I would lay down at night and it was like a video going through my head. And I would see every, I would experience all over again the agony and the pain and the rejection and the frustration of growing up poor. So many circumstances and many events finally led me to the poor. I found out where they were. Oh, I had never totally left because we would take bums and prostitutes and they'd come and live in our big fancy house and all the neighbors hated us because we were reaching out to the poor. But the Lord wanted more. He wanted us to go and live among the poor. He wanted us to go and to let him live through us among the poor. And that was very difficult. Now, I look back seven years later, actually eight years later, because we took the first year to prepare. And that led us to Boise Calvary. Praise God for the study center there. And that's one reason why I'm grateful to be able to share on this, this task force for the study center, because I know the importance of it. Thank God that someone had a vision that other people would need to learn and need to, need to know how to start community development works. I thank God for Dolphus Weary. I don't know if he's here yet or not, but he'll be here tomorrow at least. Because he not only said, I'll walk beside you, but he did it. He not only said it, he did it. And for seven years, no, for seven years, he's held my hand. And he said, Kathy, this is the way to walk. This is what the Lord is doing. And I'm grateful. After seven years, I can look back and I can see the Lord beginning to pull my heart the heart tug of, of working with youth. After I came back from DOC, I had to say, Lord, now, how do you take all of these years, 20 years of work and labor and sweat and prayer and start that in Dallas, Texas? And the Lord began to burden my heart for kids. And he put an idea there. He put an idea in my mind that said, if you can start with the kids, and if you can win the trust of the kids, and you can win the trust of the community, there's nothing that I can't do. And I can raise up leaders for West Dallas. I can raise up leaders in these kids that will want to do something in their community. So Boys Adult Ministries now has a lot of adult ministries. We have a dental clinic that's run by volunteer dentists and dental hygienists. We have financial services. We have a health club which is utilizing Christian music as well as Dr. Cooper's protocols from the aerobic center. We have job training and skills training for our kids. We have Bible classes, discipleship classes. We have sports. But do you know that every single thing that we have done in the adult community, whether it's senior citizens to shut in to a health club, has been to accomplish one goal. We want to see these kids that we started with when they were 5 to 12, that are now the young 13 to 18, become Christian leaders in West Valley. Amen. And that's what it's all about, reproducing ourselves. That's what this conference is all about, is that we can learn from each other and get better at that, and that we can really take the call that God has on the church as a whole and say, we are alive and well, girl. We're here. And we're ready to let God know. Because He really is our source anyway. As I was praying about this conference, the Lord
before I get in on the poem. I, I like poetry because sometimes it says something so much better than we can say in prose. And this, I want to say to you, is a, a word of encouragement, but also, for many of you, a challenge. As it was to me seven years ago. It's called The Witness. How can I know that he loves me? I can't see him. I can't feel him at all. How can I know that he loves me? He doesn't answer me when I call. You say, I can know that he loves me. Because the Bible tells me so. But I say he doesn't care. And I want the whole world to know. I'm angry inside for all the hell that I see. Drugs, crime, and life on the street. Who cares that I'm hungry and have no place to sleep? Don't say Jesus loves me. Are you willing to come and share my pain? Are you willing to live among poverty and shame? Are you willing to cry and walk by myself? Then don't say Jesus loves me. Will you hope and look for a way to ease life's burden in my life today? If your answer is yes, then maybe I'll see there really is a God. before becoming the new executive director of Voice of Calvary. Let's give a warm applause for Melvin Anderson.
leadership development. Let those of us involved in the lives of people have a true love for them, a desire to see, our, to see them become all that God would have them to be. <coughs> Without that love and concern for our people, we'll start putting programs and policies ahead of the very people that which we deserve. For over 25 years, I've watched Bill Sam, John and Bill May Perkins, put that love into action. Even before I knew it, even before we laid the CCD, it was happening in my life. The seed had been planted. After finishing high school, went in hall, I moved up to Jackson to attend Jackson State University. It was about the same time that H. Speeds, Herbert Jones, and the Perkins family were expanding their ministry in Jackson, Mississippi. Many of the young people that they had been working with, the men in Hall had also moved to Jackson to go to school. Eventually, the fellowship grew. Out of that was born Boston County Fellowship Church. I began attending the church and singing in the church choir with some of my friends from home. But it was not until 1979 that I gave Jesus my life. Slowly I began to understand why John and Bill made perfect had involved in my life. I began to see how God's hand was moving in my life. I started going to serve him in all areas of my life, including my child. I was working for the YMCA in 1984 when I became interested in working for a Christian ministry. I applied at Boston Cabin Ministries to be a part of their crew of the housing ministry. It's known as People's Development, PDI for short, housing and construction on Boston Cabin Ministries. <clears throat> you know, God has a great sense of humor. Sometimes I feel like he puts twists and turns and surprises into our lives just to give us a joke. <laughs> he wants us to know that we're in control. <laughs> when they finally got in touch with me to tell me I had gotten a job, it was to my surprise that they were hiring me as director of housing. <laughs> you know, I was excited, really excited about that. But I was quite challenged. I'd never been the bottom line person before. Being a manager didn't come easy for me either. But I know now that God was putting me in a place so that I could grow and develop as a leader. Sometimes it's hard being a leader, but I realize that God will never put more on me than I can handle. The second aspect of Christian community development that I want to share with you about tonight is very, very close to my heart. God has given me a burden for housing for the poor, providing low-cost housing for the poor. The 1980 census stated in Jackson, that there were some 11,000 people living in substandard conditions. That fact really challenged me. I began to dream about how I could be involved. I began to dream about how Boston Cabin Ministries could begin to meet some of those needs. I began sharing some ideas with friends, and talking with Lim. You know when you have a lot of you just dream. You know what I mean? You just want to just do something so bad, you just try to dream up and do all those kind of things. Because God is working on us. If you're out there, he'll do those kind of things to you. It was while traveling right here in Chicago with Lim that a friend of ours gave us a gift that helped us to purchase 14 homes back in one of the poorest areas in Jackson, Mississippi. Thus, Boston Cabin Ministries adopted a house program was farm. Since then, we purchased two more and have changed dilapidated duplex shotgun homes to single families homes for eight families. There's much more work to be done there more houses to build. But the change is already apparent in the community. I have a dream about the community. The dream is to transform the entire neighborhood. The changing from a typical southern ghetto of renters to a neighborhood of homeowners. As I look back over my life, I'm thankful to God for the way he used the Perkins and so many others like Lem Tucker to be examples of Christian leaders. I believe in the vision Christian community development. Had it not been for someone who believed in us, who came to our community, and lived with us, I could not stand before you tonight. In March of 89, Lim Tucker, my good friend, President of Boston Cabin Ministries, was struck with a rare form of cancer. During his illness, he appointed me as interim executive director. In June of this year, them died. 
Now I'm facing one of the hardest challenges of my life. This past September, the VOSM Board of Servants, they gave me the responsibility of the executive director. You know, I still take comfort in the knowledge that God will not put more in me than I can handle. Yeah. He's giving me a good support staff that I'm thankful for. They're encouraging me and they're helping me in this task. You know what I pray about the most? That God will continue to use all of us, whether here in Chicago, Jackson, Mississippi, or around the country. That those of us in those communities demonstrate God's love to the very people of this world. Hopefully through those of us who are living out this vision of Christian community development, other little boys just like I was, will have an opportunity to become leaders so that they can be able to give something back to the communities. This is my challenge to you tonight. That if you ever get discouraged and you begin to wonder whether or not Christian community development really works, just think about me. <laughs> think about all those other thousands of boys and girls out there who need a chance just like me. The same kind of chance that God gave me through the Perkins, through Jim Tucker, through Boston Calvary Ministries. Thank you.
draw you upon all of us to be faithful. Now we come tonight, we thank you for Ellen, Mr. Guy, we thank you for his mother, the Savior, for his brother. Lord, we thank you for all those who he meant so much to and we serve. And now Lord, we come tonight to Thank you for Mel to celebrate this life that you have saved, you have rescued, and you've led and you've brought to this place. Lord, we thank you for that. We pray your special blessing upon him, and upon his wife, and upon his family, that he would lead them, that he would guide them, and help them, Lord, to be an example of a family. In these days, we're standing up for you. We're standing together. We're raising our kids so that they can live with a, a father and mother who's going to care for them and who's going to challenge them and help them to, to develop so they can give themselves fully to their people and to all people. So what we think of that. Now we pray this special blessing upon all of us here. Continue to give us a good time this evening. We ask this in Jesus' precious name.
When I've lost my direction, you're the compass for my way. You're the fire and light when nights are long and cold. You are the laughter that shadows all my fears. When I'm alone, your hand is there to hold. Hold and Jesus, you're the center of my joy.
from the Gospel of John, chapter 5. The Gospel of John, chapter 5. That's how I just started uh, up here tonight. And I'm going to read verse, begin at verse 1 and read down to verse uh, 9. And then I'm going to come back and uh, I'm going to use verse uh, 6 as the text for my talk, uh, which I'm going to take my subject tonight and talk to you. So let's listen to the reading of this word here from the Gospel of John, chapter 5. <clears throat> After this, there was a feast of the Jews, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. Now there is at Jerusalem by the sheep gate of Pooh, which is called in the Hebrew tongue Bethesda, having five porches. In these lie a great multitude of sick folks, blind, lame, paralyzed, waiting for the moving water. For an angel went down in a certain season to the pool and troubled the water. Whosoever then first, after the trouble of the water, stepped in was made well of whatsoever disease he had. And a certain man was there who had an infirmity thirty and eight years. When Jesus saw him lying there and knew that he had been in that condition a long time, he said unto him, Would you be made whole? The sick man answered him, Sir, I have no man when the water is troubled to put me into the pool. But while I come, another steps down before me. Jesus said unto him, Arise, take up your bed and walk. And a meal the man was made well, and took up his bed and walked. And the same day was the Sabbath. What I want to talk about tonight is holistic Christian community development. Holistic Christian community development. That's why we're here. I want to take a little time to set in focus while we're here tonight. What brings us together here tonight? And what makes this meeting here tonight special and is a little bit different from most meetings that you come to? This meeting is a gathering together of people who are already in the trenches, who are already struggling with Christian community development. And so we are here today because we believe in holistic Christian community development. Let me define what I mean, and I'm going to do it in detail tonight, what I mean when I say holistic Christian community development. But let me tie it down quickly right here so you can understand it. We'll talk about the whole church taking the whole gospel on a whole mission to the whole world. Now that's important. That's important. What we're talking about that beginning is going to happen, and it's happening at the ghetto level. It's going to happen there. I'm going to share that with you. It's happening there because we who live there believe in the people who live there. And we might become the people who might have to share the whole gospel to the whole world. And so we are here. We're here tonight because we believe in, and you are here tonight because we believe in holistic Christian community development. And the reason I say taking a whole gospel on a whole mission to the whole world, because you don't want to make the people that you are dealing with and that you're working with at that moment, you don't want to make them a total project. You don't want to make them the end. Otherwise, you're going to patronize them. They are part of the end. They are part of the means to the end. They are part of joining with us to carry this good news of the gospel to the end of the world. So they are not the total project. We believe that God wants all of us to participate in carrying this good news to the whole world. And that we want the poor to be involved in that. And so we are not coming here to, to patronize the poor. 
We believe in the inherent dignity of the poor. And we believe in more blessed to give than to receive. And we are here to help the poor and to work with the poor to participate in carrying the good news. The good news is what brought us here. We believe in the good news. We believe in the good news of God. So we are here. We are here because we believe in that. We are here to form an association of Christian community developers. That's why we're here. When we're here, and we want to leave here, when we finish here on Saturday night, we want to leave here with an association that we have joined together and that we are going to support to carry this good news to the other villages around the country. And we are taking responsibility for doing that. That's why we're here. We're not just here to get, but we're here to take responsibility for the poor. And so we're going to join, we're going to develop. We're here to do that. That's why we came. You know, we've got to be clear. That's why we're here. We're here to do that. And we're going to do that this week. We're here to join together to witness God's saving power in our city. That's why we're here. We are here as a witness. I think you heard it tonight. You heard that in Kathy's testimony. You heard that in Melvin's testimony. And we are here tonight to witness God's saving power and in the city. You're going to hear other testimony like that this week. We are here to be the church in the city. To be the church in the city, to be the body of Christ, to be God's presence in the city, to be His incarnated life. We are here to be those earth and vessels that must be broke in order for His light to shine out. We are here to do that. We are here to give leadership. We are here to give leadership. We are here to assume responsibility do that. We're not here to shift the responsibility. We are here to take the responsibility. We are here saying that's our task. That's our calling. That God has called us to do that. And that's why we are gathered here. We are here to stand with and by and develop indigenous leaders. Indigenous leaders. We believe in inherited dignity of the people we're working with. We believe if they can get the tools, they can do the job. So we believe in indigenous leadership. I believe the reason the Japanese are so powerful is that the Japanese believe in inherited dignity of the Japanese. We must believe in inherited dignity of our people. When we go to the ghetto, people are not dukes and monkeys and niggas. People are created in the image of God and have dignity. We are there to affirm that dignity. And from that dignity, leadership will emerge and develop. Can't there wasn't dirty. Melvin wasn't uh, illegitimate. We are there to affirm the dignity of the people and believe that the people with the problem, given the information, can solve their own problem. That's why we're here. That's why we're here. We're here to stand by with development of indigenous leadership. We're here because we believe in the firm and dignity and the firm and dignity of the people in every community. We're here because we know the statistics. We're not here to talk about statistics. All you got to do is to read the Chicago paper and understand what's happening in terms of babies being born already dope addicted. And how we are losing that battle. We know that. We know the 64% of all the people in prison come, is coming from our ghetto communities. To my name. We know all of that. We know that the black family is shattered. We know that the family of this nation is in trouble. We know all of that. We're not here to talk about statistics. We know that. And all of us here know that. We all have written proposals. We know that. 
We know the facts.
Let's look at our passage here. And we talk about Christian men develop. Look at the passage here. Verse 1. It says, After this there was a feast of the Jews, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. <clears throat> and we're looking at this from a biblical, theological point of view. We're looking at Christian community development now from a theological point of view. I've talked about the social aspect of it. Definition. Now we're looking at it from a biblical perspective. He said that there was a feast of the Jews and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. Now let's look at Jesus. Just a minute. Who was Jesus? Jesus was the Son of God. He was God on earth. He came to show us God. He was God. The church is to be the continuation of Jesus of Nazareth on earth. The church is to be the body of Christ. The church is to be the continuation of Jesus of Nazareth life in a neighborhood and in a community. The church in the New Testament is a church and a parish. 